We're on our way to interview Toba Schiff, a Holocaust survivor who's lived in Williamsburg a really long time, who I ran into in Williamsburg during the burning of the bread. When I heard a little bit about where she comes from and how long she's been in Williamsburg, I really wanted to hear her story. She's actually lived in the projects, which are these iconic New York City low-income housing that are so storied. They're often associated with hard knocks, New York City life. They used to be a very difficult place to grow up in. Jay-Z lived in the projects uh, complex a little further down from here. So Toba's lived here for a really long time, and I'm really eager to hear her story so I'm on my way now to her place in the projects in Hasidic Williamsburg. Toba, can I can I start by asking you where you were born and what year? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, let's start there. I was born in Debrecen, that's Hungary, in 1938. I will live there not too many years because in 1940 my father died. It was before the war. Yeah, before the war came before to Debrecen. Before the war. So my parent, my mother's parents lived in Satmar. Let me clarify. Satmar is a city on the border of Hungary and Romania. It is also the name of a Hasidic sect. That's because Hasidic sects are named after the city in which a sect first begins. In this case, the Satmar Rebbe, Reb Joel Teilbaum, first began the Satmar dynasty in the city of Satmar. But that doesn't mean that residents of Satmar are particularly Hasidim or followers of the Satmar Rebbe. And likewise, many, many of Satmar Hasidim today are not from the city of Satmar originally. And we moved to them. Satmar was in Hungary at the time. At that time, Satmar was Hungary. It became Romania after the war. And when the Germans came in, the Hungarian government gave my mother protection papers that the Germans cannot touch us. Why? Because she was Because he was a Hungarian soldier when he died. The part of Hungary that was went to Satmar, that was Transylvania. And that part was Hungary at that time, and after after the war, it became Romania, and the Hungarian and the Romanian, there was always friction there, because they both wanted that part of the, uh, the country. So because my father was a soldier, we got the protection papers. How did your father die as a soldier? He was in the army. He got typhus, and they let him come home, and he died. There was no cure for typhus. There was no penicillin, no antibiotics. He was so, a religious man? Yes, yeah, sure. I have his pictures, yeah. one picture I have of him. So, my grand, we lived together with my grandparents in Debrecen. Then you moved to Sartre. Then we moved to Sartre after my, after my father passed away. And my grandparents were taken. They were put into the ghetto of Satmar and all the suburbs, all the surrounding small towns around Satmar, all the Jews were put in that, assembled and in the Satmar ghetto. And then came the time when they were taken out to the train and taken to Auschwitz. Uh, and what happened with your family? You were just... My mother, my sister and me, we stayed there. If my mother went on the street, they knew, they saw that she's a Jewish woman. She uh, uh, showed the papers and she didn't have to wear a yellow star or anything. No. Do you, do you have any memories from this? Yeah, I do. I j remember certain things, maybe because my mother told us about it, and maybe there are certain things I definitely remember. Like it what? was Like what? Let me on a Motzei Shabbos, and Sunday was Erev Shvirs. The bombing started, they started bombing Satmar. We ran down to the cellar, the, and when the first, the first bomb fell in front of our building, it was shaking like a cradle, the uh -huh. building. That I remember. The, the shaking? The shaking of the building, yeah. And I, sh I remember the cellar because my mother put down there 
some beds for us to sleep because a lot of times we had to run down. Uh -huh. Everyone, you lived like in little houses? Uh, I don't remember exactly, but we lived in that house. It wasn't a little, I mean, Satmar was a big city, is a big city. Did your family know the Satmar Rebbe? I, but I think I heard, I'm not 100% sure that my grandfather was in the yeshiva with the Satmar Rebbe. Uh -huh. That's all what I, otherwise, my grandparents were Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim is usually the term for Ashkenazi Jews, Jews from European descent, France, Germany, and Eastern Europe. But Tov is actually using it in a different context here. She's using it as the name of a congregation that operated in the city of Satmar that was called Ashkenazim, that operated in parallel to the Hasidic synagogue. But they weren't Hasidim? No. They were Hasidim in Satmar. They were two Kahilas, the Ashkenazim, and uh, Satmayabas and the uh, title and the uh, Hasidim. Hasidish minion there was and there was an Ashkenazi. And my grandparents belonged to the Ashkenazish minion. So I I me personally I, I don't know anything about the politics of my mother used to say the only thing we had with the Satmar Kahila is the Shita. Nothing else. So you'd eat their, their meat? The, the, the shkita, there was one shkita, uh -huh. shkita that both kahilas used. Use. Otherwise, so af after the, they started bombing Satmar, we knew we came out of the cellar. And uh, Satmar, you looked around, it was at night, everything you see fire, burning the houses, everything burning. Our house wasn't burned, wasn't burning, and he, the, everything was full of glass. And my mother cleaned off the glass from the beds and told us to lay down, and she went out to see something, but nothing, there was nothing. The following day was Sunday, Erev Shvias, like I mentioned before, and you know, People leave the city after bombing because they knew this is just the beginning. So my mother decided we should also go and went out to the train station. And the train station was quite a walk, went by foot, there was no other way. All the stuff, there were no suitcases. I remember my mother put in our stuff that we took with me in a big sheet and tied it up and carried it. And dragged it. Got to the train station, mother went to buy tickets. I remember when she told us we should stay there and wait. She's coming back with tickets. She, after a long wait, she came back with the tickets. And we got on the train that was already packed, but it still didn't move. And it got later and later. And my mother said, where will I light the candles? It's out of Shvias. Wow. And we got off the train and we walked back home. Uh, what's, your, what's this memory like for you? Yeah, that I remember the walk back. Yeah. And my mother seemed left and told us to stay. I mean, we were, I was five, my sister was six. But old enough to be scared. Old enough to understand that this is not a normal situation. She said she wants to see what she can find, something outside. In Satma, there were 10 families like us with the protection papers. Uh -huh. There were families who were in the First World War, fought with the Hungarian, and she met somebody she knew the name was Lazar. He was also in the First World War and he became injured in his foot, so he was limping. And he also got Protection. papers mm -hmm. and she just met him, my mother. And she asked, what are you doing? He said, he has a farm outside of Satmar and he's going out there and if we want, we can go with him. He had a wife and two teenage sons. And we went with him to the farm. On the way, we saw already the planes flying. And to see where to 
were to drop the bombs. They had those, I don't there was a name to it, but I don't remember a Hungarian name, those candles they throwing out to light up the area. To, so they so know that they where, had their plan where to drop the bombs. And we saw that we got off the, we didn't go by care, we went with the horse and buggy. Anyway, the end was that we got to that farm and we stayed there for about eight weeks. Which year is this? 44? It was 40, 42. 42, 43. The, the area was all farms, Goyam, but they were friendly with this fat, the Lazar. They were friendly. They were, they were like friends. I mean, friendly. I don't know how friends. And one night, we were already in bed, this I also remember, I mean, vividly, he comes and knocks on the window. The Lazar? The, this, this farmer. A neighbor. Neighboring farm. That he was in the, in the inn, in a bar, like they call it now. And he was, so that Germans, the Germans were retreating, two, three soldiers, they sit there and they drink and they are drunk and they have a map in front of them, on the table, and on the pen, on the map, it's marked the house where we were in, and they knew they are Jews there. Wow. And they were planning to come later on from the, from the, after the drinking, and, and eliminate us, kill us. The Hungarian neighbors were, were concerned enough about their Jewish neighbors? Yeah, to go they the came, effort? they came and they warned us to get out right away because in a couple of hours they will be coming to kill us. What's the experience of a young five-year-old about in such a... The experience, I don't think, I don't think I understood then. I don't think I knew it's frightening. I knew we had to go out from here. We didn't take anything except what we had, then the pajamas and put on a coat or something, and we got on to the carriage, and we went back to Satmar with the family, with the Lazar family. But I forgot to tell you that the following day, as we left Satmar, we heard that the train we were on and waiting to move ran on a mine. Wow, it exploded. Exploded. And I don't know if everybody, but a lot of people died. Wow. Okay. That was Mama Chanesse. Yeah. Did, you, did your mother understand it as a nest because she... I she... imagine she did. I don't know how she carried it. I don't know. You know, she, she was a young woman in 44. My mother was born in 1905, uh -huh. so she was 40, 40, 40 years old. Yeah. And she, she did what she had to do. We went back to Satmar and he deposited, this Lazar guy deposited us by a family, a Goisha family. And it was very funny, I mean, it's not funny, it's ironic. They were German people living in Satmar. And they decided to take you in? Most probably he was friendly with them and wasn't anti-Semitic because we stayed there. That I don't remember how long. But a long time? I don't remember how long, but I remember that my mother told us to eat what they give us. And we told her that if you don't eat, we don't eat. So we ate bread and oil, a little oil spread on the bread. That's what we ate. Because of kosher? Yeah. Your mother was a very pious woman. Was she a very firm lady? She, she was a religious lady, but what should I tell you? She wasn't, uh, compared to the Williams book, she wasn't. Mm -hmm. She was intelligent, smart. She read a lot. My mother used to say that when they were all single, she had four they were four sisters and one brother. 
So what do young girls do? They do embroidery. Mm -hmm. They embroidered their tablecloths ah. that they will have and the uh, linen. Colors? No, I don't remember. I, don't, I know because my mother had them still uh -huh. years later. The edges embroidered with a monogram, but you should see that work. Yeah. And the girls embroidered always for the next in line who gets married. They did all of them did for her the, the linen. And my ma grandmother was reading for them. Was what? Reading stories. Oh, while they were embroidering. Yes, yeah, she was an intelligent woman. She came from a family. My grandmother, the name was Spitz, that they were well to do. Not my grandparents, but her and parents were. They, the girls, they were nine siblings, and the girls were taught they were bringing in tutors to teach them languages and literature. The boys only yeshiva, nothing else. But the girls were taught. They were educated. Yes. So my grandmother was okay the reading. And books. she's the one who ended up in the camp. She yeah, in the ghetto. She didn't end up in the camp because she died on the train going, in the train. We heard from people later on. Mm. And the Germans came in every, every morning. They searched the people there, and what was dead was thrown out. So, okay. so what happened with, at, at this they German? They stayed there by that uh, German family. I don't remember how long, but eventually we went back to our apartment, our house. it wasn't our house, we lived there. And uh, the bridge that was, there was a river, uh, the Duna, the Danube, Danube, I called, I think, that river. And we had to cross it to go to a place to fix the windows, because the windows were all shattered. So my mother took them up and we slept them to where we had to cross that bombed bridge. bridge. And I remember, I remember the bridge that I really remember. It was dangerous, but we went up and down somehow. But it, it was cracked from the bombs? Yeah, it was cracked. It was part of it going down into the river, and then we crossed that part and went up. You know, they were like uh, quite... Uh, it wasn't, it was metal pieces that we could walk on. We were not the only ones. And then they fixed the window. I don't remember coming ever coming back, but going there, I feel. And my aunt lived in Romania, Temeswar, and we went to live with them after a while, after quite a done. And Romania, I mean, Satmar also became Romania, but was Hungary before. But where my aunt lived, was Romania, so they went, the Germans didn't have a free hand there. Uh -huh. They were taken somewhere, but not not to concentration camp. Why, because Romania wasn't allied with the Nazis? Uh, Romania didn't give them a, a free hand for uh -huh. the Germans. The, the, like, like Hungary and Czechoslovakia and other countries, uh, the German came in, or I Poland, they conquered because po the Poles Poland. fought. Yeah. fought. All right. So, so what happened? You were until I went to live with my aunt. And you were there until when? All right, there's another story coming up. My uncle, who lived in Grosvedain with his family, I, I think he had two or three children, but before the war, he was taken to labor camp. So to he wasn't to work here. Yeah. So his uh, family was taken, never came back. And he was in the labor camp. And they freed him. So he walked, 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 and he got to Debrecen. And there was there an armory. And that's where all the people were. Well, the, how should I say, the Russian were the collecting Russian. 
people who were walking on the roads. There was an armory by the Russians? No, the armory was Hungarian. Ah, ah, ah. And the Russian took over there. So they saw my uncle walking. He was they, him. they also taken him in because they they marched with a lot of those uh, from the labor camp, those people. And but uh, the they went to watch so 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 well, they didn't have enough guards, so some of them just got out, went away from that. When they counted, they always saw they have less people, so if they found somebody on the road, they pulled them in. So my uncle ended up in that armory, and he didn't know how to get, how he should get out, how he should be able to, to get in touch with my aunt. Did he know what happened to his family? Never came back. Mm. Never came back. And just going back when my my uncle remarried and he had a family, a new family. And when he passed that he lived in Israel, he passed away, he found on his pocket a wallet with an old picture of his previous family. Mm. That they didn't know. I mean they did all right. They, they, didn't, just, uh, they didn't know that he... They knew that he was married, I mean... They didn't know he carried around with and him. And that he carried all those years he carried in his, in his wallet. Yeah. When he died, all right. So my uncle, did, back to the armory, <laughs> my uncle was, didn't know what to do, how to get in touch with, uh, with my aunt, that was his sister because it uh, was my, my mother's brother also, and we were staying by my mother's sister. So uh, he, I don't know, he must have had some money from where or from what, maybe they got some before they left, if they freed them, they get them they some money. money. He bought postcards and wrote on the postcard my aunt's address, and he wrote a couple of, words, a couple of lines, that I'm here and here in the Hungarian, in Debrecen, in Hungary, and in the armory, here and here, try to do something. And he threw it out the window, daily, I don't know how many postcards. He was hoping that some, one of them, someone will pick up and will mail it, he'll throw it in a letterbox, you know, mail it. And that's what happened. So how did, how did he get out? So, so my aunt got the postcard, and so they knew he's in Debrecen in this armory, under the Russian, under the Russian guards. But so because my mother was uh, familiar in Russia in Debrecen, my uncle gave her money to go to and bribe whoever needs to be bribed to l let them go. And that's what happened. My mother went to Debrecen, and walking on the street, he sees a woman, a goite, come, and she recognizes her, her, her fur coat, my mother's fur Your mother, She was wearing your mother's fur coat. And my mother looked at it, and when she passed her, she looked behind her to see it, and that goite also looked, because she understood what oh, happened. Yeah. She knew that she's a Jewish woman, and it must have been her. Anyway, there was a kahila, and my mother went to the kahila and spoke to people to tell them who can be bribed in the armory. To, they should let my uncle free. And uh, it happened, they let him for money. Money can buy a lot of things. Especially in a it, war. Yeah, especially freedom. And that's how he came also back to my aunt, to Temeshwar. But he had a house in Verdain where he lived. So we went, my mother, my sister, and me, we went to live with him. Also in Romania? In Romania, in Verdain. Yeah, Verdain was Romania. And we lived there, I don't know how long, really. You didn't have bombings there? like It you was after the war already. Oh, if they bombed the city? Romania wasn't bombed. 
Oh, so what happened at the end of the war? How, how did you find out it was the end of the war? What was the experience of the war ending? The war, we were still in Satmar, and my sister and me were playing on the street in front of the building, and suddenly we see some Yidin carrying a piece of uh, cow or something on their back. So we ran in to tell my mother. So she, she understood that the Shoichet came back, oh. and some Yidin came back. So, 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 I mean, there was some news traveling going around, most probably. I don't know. I mean, we went in, well, I mean, what? I was six year old, seven year olds by then. So that's how you, you found out that the war was over, because people were coming back in the... People were coming back that they were liberated already oh. in the camps. And sure, my mother asked about her parents, the oh. people from Satmar. So she found out that my grandmother died on the train going to Auschwitz. And my grandfather, no one knew anything. No. No. So, so j just to remind me, what happened from uh, after the war? How did you get to Romania? We, we, well, this was also already Romania, Satmar. Ah, ah, ah. It became Romania after, after the, the war during the the, the, the Russian, yeah, helped. That Romania. explains the armory. So you're you're okay. Now I follow. Your uncle was liberated at the end of the war from the labor camp. Yes. I see. I see. So the entire family was reunited in Romania. And my mother and my uncle went back to Temeswar to Romania. And then my uncle had the house in Verdine. His family didn't come back. And he, we went to live with them, with him. You know, my mother without a husband, with two children, he without family, and it was, uh, we became a family. We started going to school there uh, without knowing the language, because we didn't know any Romanian. You spoke Hungarian? Hungarian only. But Yiddish also? No. You didn't speak Yiddish? No. Your mother didn't speak Yiddish? My mother did. Uh -huh. My mother did. How did you learn Hebrew? Then we, in 51 we went to Israel. Uh, 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 okay. How do you know that I know Hebrew? I spoke to you on the phone. You said you speak four languages. Yeah, <laughs> right. I didn't remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh -huh. So, so did you, you went to a gymnasium? Big pun? In Romania, you went to gymnasium, public school? No, the regular public school, elementary, uh, first grade. The boys and girls together? Yeah, COVID. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, there was no problem. There, there was no... I don't know what the boys did. You know, I don't they, know They what. went to yeshiva. There was an yeshiva. There must have been some... some there was cable. a shoychet right when the war ended. There was a All right. I don't know. I know, know what we did and uh, where we went. My sister also said that she's a year older, but she started also first grade because we didn't know the language. Uh -huh. I think the war affected me somehow, mentally. In the first grade, we had to graduate in, not before the graduation, you had to know how to read, and I couldn't grasp the trick of reading. Really? My uncle, my mother, we, they sat with me and tried to... to Get you to pick it up. To, to, to try, I should try to understand nothing. Came to the test. The test was in the first grade, we sat together with my sister, that you had to read. Well, I didn't know how to read. So my sister read it very slowly, and I... You copied I, her. I repeated it after her. I passed. All right, I, we were there. I don't know how long. If I went to second grade, I don't know. But someone was read to my mother, and he came to a show that I remember. <laughs> It was Sukkot, and my aunt, my another aunt from Temeshvar, the youngest of the of the sisters, came down because she wanted to also see who this guy is, who this man is. 
and he killed him. He was him. a survivor? Yeah, he was a survivor. He had 12 children before the war, and one son came back. Wow. He was, he was in the camps? I think he was in Buchenwald. He was at the death march. He, he did everything. Wow. He went through everything. So what happened? Uh, so happened so my, he lived in a place, it's called Shomkut. In Romania, it's called Shomkut Amare. Hungarian is Shomkut. He lived there. And close to it, there's a town. It's a city town. It wasn't a big city if it was called a city. Banyo. And my mother had an uncle there. And he knew him. His name was Kaufman. And she read him. And he came down. And the man washed and went into the sicker. And my aunt and my mother stayed behind. And my mother made like this. No. <laughs> That's what you remember. I remember. I was there. I remember. I was, uh, must have been seven. My mother made like this to my aunt. Not to us, to my aunt. And we, okay, then we also washed, went into the sicker, and the meal continued. And what happened after that, but I mean, what my mother said eventually, that she realized that he's not her type. He was from a small town. He was more, more like a plain man. My mother was an intelligent, well-read woman. And, and, and he was a plain, but she realized that he's a very good man. He's uh -huh. a good man. She was right away to ask if we need, if the children need anything. Uh -huh. And she decided to marry him. He was your stepfather? My stepfather. You had a good relationship with him? Yeah, I mean, he was a wonderful person. Wonderful person he named Kaufman, Moshe Kaufman. And we went to live to Shomkut. Uh -huh, where he was? Where he lived. He had one son. The son was also there. And a couple of nieces, his brother's daughters. And we went to live there. We went to school there. They got married, let me see, or 48 or 46. I'm confused. If it was 48, then I was 10 years old, but it must have been 46. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was 10 years old yet. No. And we lived there maybe a couple of years, two, three years. And then my parents went to school come under the communists. Also, everything together. I mean, so much that my, we call them father, Apuka. He was, he had a very good relationship. First of all, let me tell him about him. Very easygoing. Mr., uh, your, your stepfather. Yeah, Catherine. very easygoing. Very well liked by Yidin and by Goyim. He was, had a very good sense of humor. Yeah. So he, he a very easygoing, nice Your mother man. was happy with him? I think so. I think so. I mean, they live together. I mean, you know, it's not like uh, 20 year olds. He was older than my mother. I don't know how many lost such a family. Did he talk about it? Did you hear him talk about it? Uh, yeah, he spoke a little, not there in, uh, after they were taken, but before. He was very strict with the children. He said, you not, uh, how did he express it in Yiddish? Because he only spoke Yiddish. He knew Hungarian, but by him the language was Yiddish. We spoke Hungarian and he spoke Yiddish. That For was his child. philosophy? That was his philosophy. You You're not allowed to give in? No, you don't give in to children. And there was no chokmas. You had to do what your parents tell you. Uh -huh. Anyway. Very old school. Very old school. I mean, my mother, in the later years, she had, she lived here in the building on the seventh floor. She was over 120 passed away. She had a home attendant, a Hungarian goiter. 
in Europe, the children were beaten up by the parents if they didn't listen. That was the the way of Hinoch. That was. What does that have to do with the? Age? Nothing that you say that it wasn't uh, like today. You're not allowed to touch it. It was all right. It was different anyway. So that was the story. What the the Hungarian aid? The homemade, my mother told us how ah. her father used to beat them up. Oh. That, that's, that's how was the, uh, the European way of raising, raising children. Oh. Did you have a nice childhood in Romania after the war? I don't know what you call that. When we lived before my, before my mother, we married. Yeah, we were, uh, I remember, we were happy. It, life just went on normal. You went to school, you came home, you ate, you played with the friends. Normal. Uh, did you play with only Jewish friends? No, I don't think so because the school was full of guys. I mean, it wasn't a Jewish school. Uh -huh. So how come you came to America? What? Because in 1951, my parents decided that there is no future for us in Romania. Uh -huh. It's the communists. We had to go to school on Shabbos. Is that what happened? That what happened, but the principal, to, he said he must insist. He said he has no choice because he knew my father. He had no choice, but they can. They we won't have to do anything, not write or anything. Just be in in school, mm -hmm. sit by the desk. So we went without doing anything. And then my parents realized it's, it was the communists, that it's no future for us. Because so, the communist assault on religious life, essentially. The communists are, uh, a religious, is communists came in, a religion out. Yeah. How did the war impact your, your parents' religious life? My mother was a very religious woman, not, not Hasidic, but you no. Know, I want to I tell you, gets off the train that we want to get away from the war, yeah. and she gets off because she's, she has to light the candles. I mean, that says something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that make a strong impression on you? No. No, you were... I don't, don't know what impression. How do I know what a, a five-year-old impression? Yeah, yeah. And if someone says that they know, remember certain things, but the impression, the thoughts. I guess we can go back and try to think about how it shaped us. It, of course, we're, we're making a story out of our lives. I don't know. I really don't know. You don't I really know. don't know. Then, uh, then, then we went to, my parents applied. You couldn't get, they didn't let you leave. They didn't give you visas to leave the country. But if you waited long enough, we got the visa to go, to leave, and we went to Israel. To Israel? Yeah. That was in 51. 51 you went to Israel? Israel, yeah. Again, a new language. Wow. Again, going to school with, with a new language. Did you go to a religious school? Or? Yes. We went. The Aliyat Hanoar, when you know there was an influx of New Orleans, yeah, and Aliyat Hanoar took all the youngsters and put them in Mosdot. Uh huh. Sure. But there was there were problems because they didn't want the Aguda wanted to religious young young people, I mean the boys, the girls to to religious Mosdot, and sure, the government wanted the kibbutzim and to live against the religion, that's for sure. And we ended up, my sister ended up somewhere else, and I ended up in Yerushalayim, and, uh, and in a religious Mossad. We went to school, we walked to school, because the, the Mossad was only board, room and board. I mean, you ate there, you, you lived there, but to school we went out went to Catamon. So how did you end up in America? Oh, well, I I finished there. I came back home. My parents lived at that time. Now they lived in Tveria also and I lived in a couple of places in Bnei Brak. And I came and I was already marriageable age. Uh -huh. 
and a lot of young men went to Israel to get married. Young men from America? Yes. Why, there weren't girls in America? I don't know. There weren't girls, the Europeans died. Wow. I remember my husband said he once wants to have a show and they were sitting watching television. The family? He and the girl. Really? That yeah. was the show. It was, yeah. a, it was an old-fashioned date. I don't know, but it wasn't... It wasn't the, right. It wasn't the European style or flavor. I see, I see. So you got married in Israel? Yes. What, did you meet any other boys besides that? Yes, before. Yeah, I did. Uh -huh. So how old were you when you got married? Twenty. Twenty. So you came to America because he was in America. Yeah, he was, he was also from Europe. He was also a survivor, like no, you? he was in Siberia, oh. to the world. You know, he was in po he was in Poland, from Poland, Yaroslav, that was Galicia, and they were taken to Siberia. In Siberian labor camps over there, was it like I, yeah, it must have been a labor camp. I think so. He remember he tells you how they had to work and. I don't have to tell you what the winter is there. Yeah, yeah. Suffered a lot from he the... He suffered a lot. A lot from the cold. And then they came here. He, my sister-in-law wanted to go to Israel. And he wanted to come here with his mo mother. But they came here by the end. Uh-huh. What, what was it like to get used to America? Was it a, a shock for you? What? To get used to America. Mm, well, it's a different culture, but I, you know, I went to the movies in Israel. Everybody mm -hmm. went to the Shabbos was movie time. Uh -huh. And when I came here in '59, the building, you know, right, uh, the Ohev Shalom, the shul, yeah, that's right, no. say, across from it, they built a house. Now they, there was a movie house, and Moshe Shabbos. The Williamsburger were in the movie as the ladies. Where? On Bedford? No, Lee, on, Lee on Broadway. On Broadway? Oh, yeah. oh, oh, I see. You see. didn't go on, on where the Klosenberger Shul, it probably was already no, closed? on Bedford. On Bedford? No. Uh -huh. uh, that was a church event originally. The one on Bedford, the, yeah. the, Klosenberger. the Klosenberger. I'm talking about the Klosenberger Shul. On Lee the Avenue? Yeah, yeah, you mean the one there by U Street somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was there also? That was also a theater. That I don't know. Uh, uh, uh. So on, that, it wasn't in my on time. On Broadway there was a theater. Broadway Corner Rodney. Uh-huh. Where, I see, where the, the BQE runs. Yeah, where you, yeah. Uh-huh. So you came straight to Williamsburg? Yeah, because my sister was living here. She married three years before me. And we came here, they rented for us a furnished apartment, and we came here, and here I am since then, and we only came temporary. Really? That was the thought? That was the plan. How many years later are we? 2023? From 59? Yeah, from 59. We're not doing math. No. <laughs> We're not doing math. So how many children did you have? Three. Let's see. Two sons and a daughter. And your your husband's not around anymore. Now already eighteen years. Eighteen years. So, what was your experience living temporarily in in Williamsburg? Well, I tell you, my husband was he comes from a Hasidic family actually. I don't know if you heard from Rabbi Shimon Yaroslav. He was a very big tzaddik. He was, I think, fifth generation from him. So he, his sister and brother-in-law are Hasidish, and the whole family is Hasidish. Mm -hmm. But my husband... He wasn't Hasidish. No. We've no. seen pictures. But we have the... You saw... But he, we have the Hasidish in Hugam, and, the, and we daven the Hasidish away, Swadish. Uh -huh. So, and, and you speak Yiddish by now? I speak Yiddish, yeah. First of all, my and husband... My husband knew English and Yiddish, and I knew Yiddish, but I wasn't practicing it because we all, in Israel, we spoke Hebrew, 
and to my mother we spoke Hungarian, and to my father also Hungarian, but he always answered in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. But it Your was apuka. 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 That's an anyuka, that's my mother. Mm -hmm. He was a very nice man, very, very nice man. One of my grandsons are named after him. After him? Moshe? Yeah. Moshe, yeah. Sweet. The one who became a lawyer. A lawyer. He's a lawyer, yeah. He's practicing the law. He, just the first year, because he finished law school in, in Chicago. Chicago, now you see how my mind goes? You, we couldn't remember earlier, so we'd ha we don't have to try again. <laughs> he finished law school somewhere and he came back. He's in Manhattan now. He lives in Lakewood ah. and travels to Manhattan. Ah, very sweet. A very large law firm. I want to ask you a little bit, Tova, about the experience of living in the project, because it's very nice now. No, they made it over last year, you know, it wasn't, didn't look like this. I tell you, we lived a couple of years on Wilson Street, and then they opened here in 1964, and my husband said, no heat can live in a project, that's for the Goya. I said, well, I had a friend who was there, let's go and see them. We went to see on Mars Avenue and uh, we liked what we saw. So I applied and we got the apartment. Not this, higher up on the 13th floor. We lived there like six years. And then when the children were born, I got this larger apartment. Do you use the Shabbos elevator? No. I want to explain what a Shabbos elevator is. On Shabbos, you're not allowed to use an elevator because you're not allowed to press buttons. There is a loophole called a Shabbos elevator, a special elevator that's been programmed to stop on every floor so you don't have to press any buttons. When the projects were first built, there was a big question around if a Shabbos elevator was permitted, and in part because of the Satmar Rebbe's more conservative lead, the Shabbos elevator was generally not considered okay, and Tova to this day does not use the Shabbos elevator. You never used the elevator? No. But people, from people uh, did? It, some people who can't walk the steps. Uh -huh. what, what do you do now? You're on the eighth floor. I'm going up and down. Really? Yeah. Good for you. You probably have thighs of steel. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I am used to be a big walker, but uh, no, I don't walk so much. But I, to work, I had to, I don't know, you know, Hayward Street? Yeah. The school there. Yeah, the there. elementary school. Yeah, the 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 lower floors are Satmar High School, and the higher floors are Pupa. And I walked from here to Haver and Harrison, round trip around going and coming. Mm -hmm. Every day, so I mean, you were you were for for the video. We should say that you were a uh, secretary at the Pupa Girls School for, for 37, 37 years. years. Very nice memories, very nice people, very nice memories. Yeah, which year is 82 I you think started? in 80, uh, three years ago I stopped. This is my third year that I'm not working. Wow. But I have very nice families, very, very good memories, very, I enjoyed it. It was a good experience. Yes, yes. They, they knew that I'm not Hasidish, but they didn't make a difference because they knew, they saw what I am. Yeah. You're a quality woman, Toba. Thank you. And I am not a hypocrite. I never show something that I am not. But you see that what you get. Yeah, yeah. from the moment I, I, I spoke to you, <laughs> you say it as it is. <laughs> it's wonderful. So, yeah, you, so you want to tell me what um, your what, what have you seen in Williamsburg? Because Williamsburg has been through. You know, my work is about documenting Williamsburg. Yes, it was in, in the past. You mean the what? If you can maybe tell me the the changes you've seen. Oh yeah, since you moved here. Changes. First of all, when I came here. The people who lived here were all survivors. Uh -huh. The oh, Satmar had the biggest school and yeshiva, and why? Because he took the lowest tuition. 
Uh -huh. No matter about your background, if you applied, you were accepted, and the tuition was the lowest. Uh -huh. So everybody, they were all survivors who came here, worked in factories. Some of them made their business, worked in factories, starting to raise families. Some of them were married before that lost the previous yeah. uh, family, and some of them not, but they, they were all people from after the war. And if it's, uh, you know, that's how Satma became so big. Uh, but uh, almost no one was actually from Satma. No, has nothing to do of being, except my mother. Yes, <laughs> you. She, she is buried in Satma. In the sat in in Kiriasioil, because when she came here, she knew she has to belong somewhere. Why? Where? I mean, what does she has with Wien or Vishnits or, or belts? What? Or the other sex? Right. Satma, she knows she's from Satma, so she she became a member. When did she come? My mother let me see. My father. They lived in Israel. My father passed away. So, but exactly what year? Before the Satma Rebbe passed away. No, after. After, after. After. So she never got to cross paths with the Satma Rebbe. She had, I mean, she never had anything. They went to a Rebbe, so they, but I don't remember her ever going to the Satma uh -huh. Rebbe. Uh -huh. But my uncle, my father, my mother's brother was at that time when he was already here the Sigeter was the rebbe not the, 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 Irish. the next one the nephew yeah. and he was in first name basis with my uncle uh -huh. he knew him well my 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 uncle was a very big very big uh, Satma. Who Yeah, we didn't have a little bit. He came to us once for Shabbos. Shabbos. No. No. Came for us for Shabbos and before he went down to Darwin, to Satma. He showed me which necktie he should put on. I said, Borough Lonky, whichever necktie you put on, you will have the nicest necktie. In the Satma Bismar. <laughs> Was there wasn't a, a lot of competition for neckties. No. <laughs> so I said, so, so, but he was a very big Satma uh -huh. So what changed in Williamsburg over the years? So first there were survivors. Do you see a lot of survivors? Do you see... All the old people are survivors, I can say. I go to a, to exercise class. It's for seniors and there are, I don't think all survivors, not all survivors, but there are a lot of survivors. The difference, well, the new generation grew up and they have different needs. Mm -hmm. Like what? Like, I mean, you see the stores here, the clothing store, the children's stores. Where do you see this? Another, except Borough Park. Nowhere. Who buys those, those expensive clothing? Stylish things. Not only that, expensive it's style. It's European, so it's, it's... It's, you can be stylish. In Israel, like my daughter says, they have cheap chic. They, because the clothing yeah. is not expensive, but they are very stylish. Yeah, it's a Williamsburg thing, it's a... Change, you are change, Williamsburg change. They have the needs and they, they buy and you see the young. Or oh, this is already an, another generation now, but uh, that that change, and otherwise I don't know. I mean I don't have to tell you that people live differently than in the sixties, right? Then then from Jews in the sixties. Right from Jews in the sixties. Plainer. Are you saying it's, it was plainer? It was. Oh, sure it was plainer. Do you, do, in a way, would you say it modernized? Modernized in technology. In technology, yeah, yeah. Which you're you're struggling to to keep no, up with. No, no, we we don't have a television, but in the computer you have everything. Yeah, yeah. 
and on the cell, I mean the iPhones, I mean, you don't have to have a television today, it's, it's no, no problem, because you have everything on your cell. Yeah, you could but watch we the don't have world. television. You didn't have television when you came to... I had a television when the children were very small, because my husband at that time worked at night, he came home like in the middle of the night, and he felt bad so at that time, but that was till the children became older. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But since then we don't. Do you remember a time when it was very high crime, when it was very scary? Yes, it was very. Which years would you say? I tell you, before Giuliani. Before Giuliani? Mayor yeah. Giuliani? Yes. It w would you be afraid to walk around in the project? I, I'm Borges, I'm not afraid. You're not a... No, I'm not, but people are, even today. It's so safe now. Now it's safe. But you know, there used to be Chapsam. Chapsam is a very particular part of the history of Hasidic Williamsburg. From the 1970s to the 2000s, New York City went through a period of substantial decline, and Williamsburg in particular saw the brunt of it. During that time, it was an extremely dangerous neighborhood with constant crime, assault, violence, armed robbery, break-ins into homes and cars, and anyone who could afford it would leave the neighborhood. The Hasidic community did not, however, and instead they organized a community vigilante operation where anyone who was assaulted would scream out the word chaptzim. It is Yiddish for catch him, and whoever was within earshot would come running to try to help apprehend the thief. The period of the Chaptim is largely behind us because New York City has made a revival. The neighborhood is largely very safe. And in my many years and my many visits to Hasidic Williamsburg, I have never yet observed a Chaptim. You know what that is? You heard about it? Yeah, yeah. There is no more Chaptim. I don't know. It's the people maybe around here. They learn that it doesn't pay because if they catch you, they beat yeah. you up. The police will stand in the side and let and let the hidden beat up. But no, I think crime went down. It, it used to be you would beat up the person. The hopsum was if someone was robbing you, you'd yell hopsum and everyone would come and to hop If they heard you, they all run from all sides and they and they beat up the thief. Yes, they beat him <laughs> up. And that's a, that's an old. Uh, that's all. I mean, it's not not here anymore, Baruch Hashem. Yeah, that was a a different time. A different time, and then uh, Giuliani cleaned up the city. Uh huh. But since then, I don't. Baruch Hashem, here it's quiet. It shouldn't change. It shouldn't change. You I like the quiet. That you need crime. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what I mean quiet. by quiet. That's what I mean by crime. <laughs> crime wise. Crime wise, yeah. Williamsburg changed a lot over the years. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, but uh, only the lifestyle. The lifestyle. That's your the change that you see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like suddenly, everybody's wearing white socks. White socks are one kind of Hasidic men's garb. It consists of men wearing knickers and knee-high socks, and the garb, because it is less Western, is considered more from more devoutly religious. But what you didn't see. Uh, you mean the more, men, religion, more the conservative men. clothing, more traditional clothing. More, and, and, and it's, it's uh, all right. I don't say anything, because they are wonderful people. Yeah? They are wonderful, I can say. I really, I work there. You don't have to be more Hasidish than, than Pooper, right? Beautiful memories. Yeah. Yeah. In the Pooper school with all the girls. And all the all the Pooper population, very nice people. Even. And if you ask my daughter if she would go anywhere else to live, because at one point let's get out, let's move somewhere else, she wouldn't go. No, you're no. attached to... You are, somehow, you get used to it and you, you, you like it. After I talked to Tova, she showed me around her lovely apartment on the eighth floor where she had lived for so many years and raised a family. Her window actually overlooks the Williamsburg Bridge and the Manhattan skyline, and until 2001, she could see the Twin Towers straight from her window. 
We also looked at so many lovely photo albums, memories of a time gone by, fashions that are no longer in fashion, and I was struck by the warmth with which she spoke of the memories of herself and her mother, her mother who ended up living in this building for many years and with whom after so many early years of instability and suffering they had experienced truly what it is to be home. Mm -hmm.